There we go. There we go. That should be working. <laughs> Hello, everyone. How is it going? How's it going, guys? What is up? Finally, finally, we have the United Kingdom episode. Dude, I am excited. I was going to do the video yesterday, but honestly, I just had a lot of things to do and work and stuff. But I was like, today I got to do Oyred, my man, thank you so much for joining us. You're, I think you're the only one right now. Let me, so let me just hook up the chat. You know, I got to do a few things on the stream over here. But uh, guys, you know, feel free to hang out. Uh, we'll start shortly, you know, five minutes till some people join. But this, I'm only going to do geography now. Uh, tomorrow, I actually have to go to Mexico City. Uh, I, I, and it's just that like, complicated, you know? I can't, this was like the perfect day. Okay. Boom. There we go. That looks all right. And this also looks fine. I guess. Yo, what's good? Loading b Mooth. b Mooth, sorry, not Mooth. AC, what's up, my man? Julia Reyes, how are you? Yeah, 47 minutes, huh? That's a long one. I, I mean, in fact, that has to be like the longest Geography Now episode uh, to date, right? I don't, I don't remember any episode lasting longer than 30 minutes, you know? It's just like long and i'm glad you know i'm happy because you know a huge country very influential the united kingdom a lot of history uh, a lot of demographics going on you have a lot of explaining to do right so you know just a lot of things so i'm happy that the episode is long because to be honest there's a lot of things to cover so i'm happy you know i'm, I'm happy over i watched around 10 minutes already okay is it good i imagine it's good right plus the next one is the one in the United States. And I think I am a little more excited about that. So I I, I also want to watch the one in the United Arab Emirates, uh, but later, we'll watch later. So I think there's a few of us already. Um, the longest episode was Russia, really. How long was the Russia episode? Let's see, just out of curiosity. It's 32. No, I'm pretty sure that there's longer ones, right? The, the UAE is 34. Ukraine is 33. Uganda is 32. So he's been releasing longer episodes, but I don't think he has released any beyond 40, which I think is huge. I think the United States episode, I think that's that's going to be like an hour long, really. We'll be first to break an hour. Exactly. Yeah, I totally agree. I think the U.S. will break the hour benchmark. So I think there's a few of us. I think we're ready to start watching this beautiful, beautiful video. Um, Geography Now UK. Yeah, let's go. Hey, Geography Peeps. As you know, I'm American and I just got my uh, Anglophone family reunion invite. So oh my God. I guess I have to show up to be polite and all. He went all the way to the UK? Well, of course, yeah. Zimbabwe would be like 10 hours. <laughs> wow. Hi, Dad. Hi, Dad. What? It's time to learn geography now. Hey, everyone. I'm your host, Barb. Just get your Geography Now merch like this Geography Now t-shirt. Yeah, it's, it's funny since the U.S. history is pretty short, so I feel like more of the episode will be about, yeah, demographics and, you know, politics and even uh, the physical geography. The U.S. has it, not only a massive country, but it has a lot of features to explain. So, yeah, history will be short, but 
anything otherwise will be wrong. Not selling out if it's your brand. Well, here I am in the big crumpet, the big <laughs> uck, the land of kings, queens, and in-betweens. At one point, a quarter of the world's yes, population sir. and land area was under yep. their rule. Of course, such a story came with lots of complicated chapters. And when it comes to complication, usually it's best to have a person from the country come along and help out. And for this episode, I could not think of anyone better to speak on behalf of the UK than my go-to Brit. Many of you already know him. Come on in, ladies and gentlemen, say hello to Mr. J. Foreman. Hi, hello, hello. Thank you so yes. much. I've always wanted to be on A British now. person. Please, uh, oh my God. I think I started watching Geography Now. Oh, <laughs> whoa. You accidentally stole a map from an episode of Map Men, and now we're the best of YouTube. Yeah. Friends. Yeah, I stole your map. I, I, I've probably stolen more from elsewhere. By the way, Jay, a lot has probably happened over the years. What have you been up to? Uh, this. Oh, yeah. You, oh, you made something. Yeah, I yeah. made one of these. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's really good. Yeah, so uh, let's talk about your country now. Shouts did it. We. That is how we talk. <laughs> yeah, that's how they talk. You know, there's like the meme about getting a bottle of water, right? Like, hey, I want a bottle of water. You know, like, why do they talk like that, bro? Jay Foreman is a goaded YouTuber, really. I don't know who he is. Jay Foreman. I love Jay Foreman. Wow. I didn't even knew so he was a YouTuber. Today is very different from what it used to be. And no, yeah. we're not referencing how the island used to be connected to the rest of continental Europe yeah. via Dogger Land. Actually. And no, we're not referencing the Mesolithic Ahrensburgian hunter gatherers. Or the Neolithic agriculturalists and enormous stone transporting Stonehenge. and solstice measuring peoples. No, we're referencing a time later on when the entire island was just a mess of clans, chiefdoms, opposing monarchs, and outside monarchs trying to come in and out monarch the said monarchs. It wasn't until much later that the country actually completed unifying everything on the island of Great Britain, plus Northern Ireland, don't forget Northern Ireland, and all the overseas territories don't forget Ooh. the overseas territories and crown dependent is this gonna be like controversial though why do you think the biggest controversy is gonna be i don't know i mean I've, it feels like something's gotta be controversial but i don't know i don't think anything will be forget the crown dependency yeah because there's like a whole other thing going on yeah, well. oh yeah so like that's like jersey yeah. the isle of man and i went to some other right oh and of course you can't forget very good, very good, very good, excellent. Cheers. Actually, speaking of places in Britain, um, did you know that we've got some of the weirdest and hardest to pronounce places in the world? Okay. Leicester. Leicester. Fromy. Ruislip. Wait, 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 what? You'll okay. see. Oh my Lece God. Leicester? Leicester. Uh, that's not hard. Fromy. Fromy. Ruislip. Ch 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 Chiswick. Landfall. Sanesli. <laughs> <laughs> Slanechli. Slanechli. Oh yeah, that's Welsh, isn't it? it is Welsh. That's not oh, that Those, Welsh you those can Welshies, get. you can't trust them. Well, in any case, let's look at the map, shall we? First of all, the main chunk of what makes up the UK is Great Britain, located off the northwestern coast of the continental mainland of Europe, north of France, separated by the English Channel, and east of... So I remember learning this all the way back in high school. Uh, a lot of the Mexican kids were surprised to find out that you know, England and the UK and Great Britain is not the same. So before high school, at least in Mexico, most people used to like call it whatever, right? They would use those terms uh, in the, uh, like, I think you know what I mean, right? Um, Great Britain, England, it's all the same. But now we learned at that time that it's actually different, right? So Great Britain is like the island, the United Kingdom is, well, the whole country, including Northern Ireland, and England is just the country of England. Of Ireland, separated by the Irish Sea to the east. Worcestershire sauce. Worcestershire sauce. How, how did I well? How did I do? As well as the North Sea and to the north, the North Atlantic. The island of Great Britain is made up of three constituent countries. England, which holds about 84% of the population. That was terrible, population. right? Yeah. Scotland, which holds about 8%. Yeah, exactly. Wales, it's like about calling 1. the Netherlands Holland. Yeah. From there, they also administer Northern Ireland, which doesn't exactly have an official political title. Some say it's a constituent country. Some say it's a region or province. But to this day, it lies across the Irish Sea on the northern section Badass. of the huh. island of Ireland, making it their largest land border with any country. Outside of of Great Britain and Northern I, I Ireland, guess the, though, only the UK has three crown border, dependencies right? and 14 overseas territories, 12 of which are small islands in the Caribbean, Atlantic, Indian, and Pacific Oceans, and two of them, Gibraltar and the sovereign bases of Akrotiri Oh, and Gibraltar, Kelly, get back, Gibraltar. to the larger shared land masses of Spain and Cyprus. Keep in mind the crown dependencies of the Isle of Man, Guernsey, and Jersey are technically not considered Guernsey, part of the UK, okay. but are still subject to the UK's defense and international representation. And finally, the British Antarctic Territory and its main base at Rothera is a 
section of Antarctica that does not have any actual sovereign status, as all countries are subject to the Antarctic Treaty, which states no one can colonize the continent. <laughs> Is he going to talk about fall? like the Falklands? Yeah, they, there they are. So like the Falkland Islands, uh, I guess this is like the Cayman Islands, uh, the British Virgin Islands, uh, a bunch of islands, right? St. Helena is over here. Uh, yeah, it's just under the UK's sovereignty, bunch spans of across nine things. time zones. Anyway, back to the main island. This is where things take a twist. First off, keep in mind, each of the constituent countries of Scotland and Wales, as well as whatever you want to label Northern Ireland, has their own parliament system with a head called a first minister. Whereas England does not have its own separate parliament, as ah. they just use the same country capital's Westminster Palace building as the meeting place for all English elected constituent officials, since it's pretty much always been the spot used for them anyway, and they see no need to complicate well, that is further. Interesting. On paper, England has 48 counties, Scotland has 32 council areas, Wales has 22 principal areas, and what Northern Ireland has six counties. Though. However, keep in mind that many of these are disputed, people don't pay attention to them, and many might just refer to their traditional areas, which is another topic. In any case, the capital and largest city and largest city in Western Thanks, Europe though. is London. After that, is New Jersey named after Jersey? I think so, right? Yeah, New Jersey, Jersey. I, I think it probably is. It's Manchester at number two and Birmingham at number three. Also, keep in mind the city of London or the city of London Corporation it's has its own one, separate yeah. government, which is independent from the rest of the country. Where this the means that the Lord Mayor of London is technically the highest ranking official in the UK after the monarch, even though the city of London oh, in itself wow. is just one small part of Greater London. Yeah. London alone has four of the top ten busiest airports in the country, Heathrow, Gatwick, Heathrow. Stansted, and Luton, whereas outside of the London area, Manchester International comes in at number three and Edinburgh International at number six. Just on the east side of England lies the port of Felixstowe, the largest and busiest shipping port of the country. The country has a very extensive road and rail network and otherwise London's Waterloo and Victoria are the largest train <laughs> Fun fact, Yemen is the only country that begins with the letter Y. I guess and the that completion makes sense. of the Channel in 1994 officially connected the UK to the rest of mainland Europe I via France. Except literally no one calls it the Channel ever. I call it the Channel. No, you don't. I call it the Channel. channel. channel or the Eurostar or Le Shuttle or anything but Channel. No one says Channel. Calling it Channel. <laughs> So as you can see, when it comes to the administrative divisions, the UK is quite possibly the biggest nightmare in the world. And keep in mind, we didn't Why? even mention all the other confusing administrative levels. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah. Authority areas, metropolitan counties, lieutenancy areas, or lieutenancy areas, depending how you want to pronounce it, parishes, wards, it's a lot. Yeah. To help a little bit more on understanding on how all these things actively work, we could mention the 650 constituency system in which 650 small concessions of the country get represented in the parliament with a representative. It's so complicated. The way we do things in this country is, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And if it is massively broke, still don't fix it. Anyway, off of that <laughs> note, uh, the UK has a bicameral legislature consisting of the House of Commons and the House of Lords. So the House of Commons is the one that you see on the telly, and the House of Lords is the big room next door where they wear robes and it's weird. And the wigs too, right? Wigs sometimes, and yeah. They're appointed. Are so they? there are four ways you can get into the House of Lords. Uh, I thought the... I thought the wigs were not used anymore, you know? I, I, I thought they like dress normally or well, like in suits maybe, but is by giving lots of money to the governing party and then they sort of as a favor make you a lord but that's not officially how it works so don't I, I, that's not what i said the other way is if you're an expert in something like uh, the law or the arts or beer the other way is if you happen to be born with a dad who's already a um, hereditary peer so it can be hereditary it can be hereditary hmm. and you're allowed to become a member of the house of lords what as happens long if... as you don't have any older brothers isn't it insane hmm. some british place names just from looking at the name you can tell which part of the country it's in so for example if it's got a celtic name, which means it has words like tre, loch, brin, and abba, that means you're likely to find it Welsh. in Wales. Or if it's got a Viking suffix such as thwaite, thorpe, kirk, or be, uh, you're Scotland. to find it in the north. And then oh. there are the Anglo-Saxon place names. Well, I guess not. Ding, Ham, Berry, Ford, the Paul, and so on and so on. So you can actually tell which group of people influence which area based off of the suffix of the name of the place. Yeah. Sort of. I think also New Mexico is the one, you know, but I think that's pretty obvious, uh, the name. New Hampshire, New York, which is based in York, I guess, in Hampshire. Although that was probably more true hundreds of years ago, and now these days all the names get mixed up and they come up with new place names all the time. Okay. Okay. I gotta have that trotter's bottom. So all of that brings us to the obvious topic. The UK is a constitutional monarchy. Technically, the king is in charge, and it's his country, and it's his laws, but how this practically works is he's just a ceremonial figurehead, and it's actually the government and the prime minister that make all the actual decisions. I mean, do, do the British people actually like the king? I guess the queen, the queen was really loved, but King Charles, what is it? I mean, I don't think anyone really likes him that much, do they? Or maybe, I don't know. Also, New England. Yeah, that's true. That's also true. 
decisions, but he could also step in if he wanted to. Yeah. In yeah. theory, he yeah. could, could step in and say, I don't like this law, but he knows full well that if he tried that, there'd yeah. be an instant revolution and we'd set Buckingham Palace on fire. You got another Oliver Cromwell. Oliver case. Cromwell. Jay did yeah. a lot of videos on this type of stuff. We'll just put oh, an yeah, annotation. Just check out his videos. Long story short, it wasn't always this way. In fact, the UK's history is more like the combined histories of the three constituent countries of Scotland, yeah. England, and Wales, plus a little bit of Northern Ireland, but that's a whole other thing. The, yeah, that's the, the thing. Like, even, yeah. even though the UK is a country, like the bits that make it up are also called countries. Yeah, there's no simple way to condense this whole history. Let's try anyway. Ancient beaker mm -hmm. culture. Celts arrived and split into the Britons, Gaels and Picts. Romans failed to conquer the Picts. They build Hadrian's Wall. Romans leave. In come the Germanic tribe. Scotland splits into four kingdoms. Egbert becomes the first Saxon king. And then the Anglo-Saxons split into seven kingdoms. Anglo-Saxon, by the way, is where the name England comes from. Ah. Uh... Uh... Cornwall falls to Wessex, but keeps its language and culture. Meanwhile, Wales was made up of many kingdoms, but the largest are Gwynedd, Powys, and Diffid. Vikings come in, raid much of the Hebrides, Island, and Isle of Man. Scots and Picts join to create the Kingdom of Alba. Danish Vikings come in and create the Danelaw. The Danelaw, also how of lots course. Lots of Danish words crept their way back into modern English, such as leg, window, and yes, even ransack, which was exactly what the Danes were doing. Anglo-Saxon <laughs> Ethelson fights against them and becomes the first king of England. Meanwhile, in the 11th century, Griffith ap Llewellyn becomes the only king that ruled over all of Wales, but then it is quickly killed by one of his own people. William of Normandy takes over England and thus begins the Norman dynasty. Angevin Empire via the House William of William the Conqueror. Begins. Crusades. Oops. Richard Lionheart plays a huge role in this. King John is terrible and then his barons the Magna Carta. Magna Carta. 1284. Edward I conquers Wales and integrates it into England, but they maintain their language and culture. Alexander III of Scotland dies and 14 rivals claim succession to the throne. 14th century. Charles IV of France dies with no heir, so Edward III was eligible through his mum, but the French were like, hell no, and elected yeah. Prince Philip of Valois. And that ain't gonna the 100 do. years war. Yes, this is when the Joan of Arc thing happened. Edward III dies, many claimants to the throne rise up, and thus begins the War of the Roses. 16th century Tudor dynasty yes, begins, yes. and Wait, thus please, all that crazy Henry VIII please, stuff go down. You know the history? Divorced, what? beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded, survived. It's cute because it rhymes. Meanwhile, in 1585... The hey, Thomas! It's good to see you, man. Now more than ever, because at least we need uh, someone from the UK, you know, in, in the chat. The Jamestown no, settlement, okay, this, this is like actually pretty important. Into the 13 colonies. Meanwhile, the East India Company begins shortly after. Elizabeth I rule leads to the Mary Queen of Scots thing and the Spanish Armada. 17th century, Elizabeth I dies. Closest yes. relative is James VI of Scotland, and he becomes ruler. Hence, joining Scotland and England for the first time, becoming the first monarch to rule over the entire island of Great Britain. Conspirators try to assassinate him. The, go, the guy Fox thing, the yeah. That's... Charles I and Parliament have tensions, and thus begins... That's so funny. He, like, that's where the... The the mask of you know the anonymous mask uh, the, the hackers you know that's where it the comes English from. The English Civil War. But I think a lot of people know that. Cromwell becomes Lord Protector after dissolving the monarchy, but after he dies, the monarchy is restored with Charles. The is Oliver Cromwell seen as like a popular guy? I imagine so, right? I don't know much about that whole period, but. It seems like a popular guy, I, I guess. Second. Man, you guys really went back to that monarchy thing fast. <laughs> like, in the 17th century, Scotland unsuccessfully... Oh, the term guy Panama, comes from Nova there? Scotia, really? An, uh, economic crisis. 1707, the I guess that would make Scotland sense, but... Is finalized. Queen Anne dies, ending the House of Stuart, and in comes the House of Hanover. Wars, wars, and more expensive wars. Great Britain taxes colonies to try and make up for the debt. Colonies aren't happy, which leads to the War of Independence for America. Yes, the Industrial sir. Revolution. <laughs> Let's just pass over that whole chapter. <laughs> Captain James Cook swings by Australia, New Zealand, and hey, Hey, let's establish some more penal colonies. Napoleonic yeah. Wars. East India Company is met with revolt and leads to a full takeover of India in 1858. Berlin Conference split up areas that European powers would administer in Africa. World War I, 1921, land grabs from the crumbling German and Ottoman empires resulted in the height of the territorial rule for the UK. 19... Okay, mixed opinions. Scotland unifying with England because they sucked at colonizing is so funny. If you're a monarchist and royalist, you won't like him. If you're a Republican, you'll like him. Oh, okay. 22, gotcha. Island breaks. I guess that World would War II, sense, the whole Winston Churchill and the Battle of Blitz. Churchill! Happened. Afterwards, one by one, the former territories got their independence. The Commonwealth of Nations is established. Joins NATO. Paramilitary violence in Northern Ireland. Sorry about that. Yeah. Joins the, the European troubles. Economic Community, which was like a predecessor <laughs> to the EU. Monetarism policies are enacted under the Margaret Thatcher years. Falkland Islands War. 2008, global financial is that crisis. Hannah? Followed by the Scottish referendum ending in remaining part of the UK. 2016, the UK votes at nearly 52% to leave the EU. Oh, 
<laughs> uh, Queen Elizabeth II, longest reigning oh. British monarch, oh. passes away. Her son, King Charles III, is coronated. Crowned. So there you go, an oversimplified outline of the thousands of years of like 70, 20, 10% British, Scottish, Welsh history all jammed into a cheesy YouTube skit with minimal props and slapstick humor. The thing you'll hear most often from people who love the royal family is how good it is for tourism. Despite the fact that if we got rid of the monarchy, we could turn Buckingham Palace into a really expensive museum. Eh, but then there wouldn't be a monarch to like fantasize about the fairy tale monarch. Monarch, princess, king, queen nah, stuff, I know? don't know, dude. Do people actually go to England to because of the monarchs? I don't know. I don't think so. I haven't been to the UK, but if I were, it wouldn't be just like, you know, uh, uh, simp over King Charles. You know, like fuck him. Who cares? I mean, no, not fuck him. I guess he's a good monarch, maybe. But yeah. Oh, it's like, but then maybe <laughs> King Charles could retrain and get a different job as a charter quantity. Yeah, but it, it takes away the whole fantasy aspect. We think of monarchs as like magical creatures. That's the problem! <laughs> Despite an increasing number that's of the problem, yeah. which in this country means people vying for a republic against the idea of a monarchy, most Brits are okay with the royal family. It has a unique role as both representing longevity and tradition and tabloid fodder. I don't know, I really do think it does have a lot to do with tourism. Sure. And, well, and then we come in. I don't. Whereas when Brits go on holiday within our own country, we like to go to the seaside. Places like South End. The longest pleasure here in the world and speaking of which uh we got a guy who uh kind of saved a lot of people over there and he's gonna do the famous places segment come on in mr tommy boy so other than south end pier the longest pleasure pier in the world which i did save by peeing on when it was on fire true story other places you need to visit are wait London, okay 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 okay, okay. Wait, hold on hold up bro there's a lot going on here first of all where is he from? I, I Tommy boy. So, other than South End Pier, the longest pleasure pier in the world, which I did save by peeing God on. God damn, bro! Why are you talking like that? I, I don't, I don't know what he's saying. But anyway, man puts out South End Pier fire by urinating on the flames. Bro, this guy peed on a fire and saved like a bunch of people. <gasps> Bro, what? I mean, what a fucking champ dude it sounds like my cousin lol <laughs> queen elizabeth and past wills uh like diana had tons of uh foreign attraction but nowadays yeah exactly there's no members that can really care about when it was on fire true story Other oh my god dude need to visit are london obviously st paul's cathedral buckingham palace the london eye tower of london tower bridge the house of parliament big ben red telephone boxes of which many have now been repurposed police boxes for you doctor who fans stonehenge sea henge which isn't even a henge silbury hill the royal ascot and its many funny hats bath with its roman baths the jurassic coast including Dirtle door the ammonites and fossil beach in lime region oh, nice. windsor castle the shambles in York, the Peak and Lake Districts, the Eden Project. Next, we're going to do Wales. Many castles, including Carnifron, Conway, Caerphilly, Cardiff, Snowdonia, with Mount Snowdon, which you can actually go up on a train. Penryn's Lake Quarry, the underground trampoline park in Clegwed, <laughs> Dobby the House Elf's grave, where people <laughs> keep leaving their socks. So next, we're going to wow. go up to Scotland. First, you have to start with Edinburgh, with its Royal Mile. Calton Edinburgh. Hill, the castles, St Kilda, Orkney and Lewis for Neolithic stone circles, Shetland for ponies, Isla Sky, Loch Ness, what I personally think is the coolest thing in the whole of the UK, Fingal's Cave. It's on the island of Staffa. You can walk in the cave. You can walk on it, on, like, on top. There are puffins everywhere. And when you're on the boat, there are oh, whales and dolphins dude. swimming next to you. We jump across my to favorite Northern animal. Ireland, which you can actually see from Scotland. From I love puffins. I love puffins. They are the freaking best animal in the world. Fact. And we start off with the Giant's oh, Causeway, like Caracarese nice. Rope Bridge, the Titanic Museum, the Dark Hedges, and now for the Overseas Territories, the Gibraltar Rock with its mm. Barbary Apes, Jersey. I've seen this. Cows, I've seen TikTok. Guernsey, <laughs> Guernsey and Alderney, some of the most fortified islands on Earth. And go to the Isle of Man to see the TT motorbike races. I mean, over... That video? Fortified islands on Earth and go to the Isle of... The video I made on the Isle of Man... And about this whole like motorcycle race, it has like a hundred thousand views. It's insane. It went crazy viral, and I don't really understand why. But hey, thank you. I will always be grateful for that. A man to see the TT motorbike races. I mean, overall, I'm so glad I got to do this trip. It Give was me so some love. Fun. It was so fun. Like, had so we much fun. <laughs> Whew, that Dude, that's nice. That's wholesome as fuck. Or the scratchy bottom. <laughs> uh, but alas, we must move on to the next segment of this ever complicated nation, the physical geography. Mm.
Now, when discussing the landscape of the UK, most people, you know, they just kind of like default in their minds to the typical hilly green pastures or the Scottish Highlands and just uh, like a lot of rain. And yes, that does apply to much of the country. But if we're going to be technical, you can... Yeah, I don't know why it went viral. Tattles, ...frozen glaciers, <laughs> erupting volcanoes, beaches with penguins and much more. Let's look at the map to explain, shall we? First of all, the main part of the country, Great Britain and Northern Ireland, are located in the western parts of the Eurasian Plate, with many, many fault lines feeding through, especially in the island of Great Britain. The most general way to divide the island is with the Tees X line, which is an imaginary diagonal boundary that separates the lowlands with the highland regions in the north and west. This geological formation is also what contributes to some hot spring areas along the line, most notably in areas like Derbyshire and the city of Bath. The most notable fault line, though, would be the Great Glen Fault up in Scotland, which splits like a scar through the Scottish Highlands, which are the highest part of the country, and also hold the tallest peak of the country, Ben Nevis. This fault line also creates long, deep rift lakes like the famous Loch Ness, which is the most voluminous lake in the entire country, holding nearly double the amount of water in all the lakes of England and Wales combined. If you want to find the lake with the largest surface area, though, you'd have to go to Northern Ireland and visit Loch Ness. If you want to find the longest river, though, many people might mistakenly say it's the Thames, which, although it is an important river that goes through London, it is not the longest. The longest is actually the Severn River that starts in the highlands of Wales and meanders through England and empties into That's Bristol surprising. Bay. In any case, if we want to be completely well-rounded on the sovereign domain of the UK, you could include everything from the tropical beaches of Caribbean island territories Gila, like Anguilla, the Ducks and, Caicos, and Caicos. Yeah. Montserrat Island actually had an enormous volcanic eruption in 1995 that destroyed the entire southern part of the island, including oh, nice. the capital Plymouth. Uh, my area, Essex, is mostly flat and mostly made of farmland. South Georgia and South Sandwich Islands are the coldest parts of the UK's territories with permanent glaciers and protected Oh, here comes a Falklands. The South Sandwich Islands are pretty volcanically active too, especially Mount Belinda, the Mount Curry, and Mount Michael, which create an eerie sight of fire and ice when they erupt. In any case, these are all just examples that show the range of what you can naturally find in areas that fall within the sovereignty of the UK. Now, despite being a nation smaller in area than the country of Guinea and Yeah, Wales, I agree. The UK today stands with the six Yeah, I think Scotland would be a very nice place to live. Largest national economy by nominal. But what are like some other Scottish big cities? Of course, there's like Edin Edinburgh, right? But outside of that, like GDP in the world, we used to be number five. Many factors attributed to this prosperity growth, such as the Industrial Revolution or the fact that we were an island isolated, but not too isolated from continental Europe, with access to multiple naval trade routes that we dominated and protected. Now, this is where I usually take my triple shot espresso break, and Noel fills in for the rest of the segment. However, since I'm here in the UK, I guess I'll have to switch things up and do an English breakfast tea break. Coming right up. Here you go. Take this. <laughs> oh wow, this is a thing that you guys do. <laughs> Sugar. Uh, you're getting to that, that much. Okay. I mean, it's, it's not bad. It's good. But like, is there any way to make it stronger? It's as strong as it needs to be. Oh, Glasgow. Yeah, that's true. I can't understand Scottish people though. Yeah, me neither. I've been drinking it. <laughs> Can I try some? <laughs> <laughs> There's a joke in the UK that Argentina is just West Falklands. Damn. That's a burn, dude. I think in the Scottish language should be, uh, Saved from extinction? I don't know, man. I mean, I guess. I don't hate it as much as I should. You don't hate it as much as. Yes! <laughs> America and the UK join forces! All right, the UK. Let's get to it, okay? So historically, many of the parts that made up the UK followed some brutal and ineffective economic practices. For example, people were expected to stay and work in their home parishes, even if there was no work. Those that wandered off to find work elsewhere were deemed vagabonds, and if caught, were subject to things like whippings or being put into stocks. Yeah, that didn't work out so well. Eventually, though, over time, many parts of what are now England fell into a system of mercantilism, or a policy that attempted to maximize tariff exports with quotas while minimizing imports. That kind of worked, but as you know, most of the world hates tariffs, so eventually they had to drop that system in 1840. The Industrial Revolution was without a doubt a game changer that launched the UK into global dominance. Things like the sewing machine, steam-powered engines, and turbines, the telegraphs revolutionized the entire manufacturing system, where now things were made by machine instead of by hand. Every region had their distinct industry and resources. Newcastle focused on shipbuilding, from Manchester, cotton, Middlesbrough, iron... It's like calling mainland China West Taiwan. I don't know, man. I think this one is a little bit different, you know, just because of the, um, the fact that, you know, Taiwan is like the main territory of 
well, Taiwan. But the Falklands is just like a small island, you know? I think I think it's just Steel, a sick bird, you know? Wool and linen. Argentinians are not going to be happy. from the UK to India in hours. You could arrive to a destination in a few hours via train instead of days by horse and carriage. With this new advancement and advantage, the UK changed their strategy of becoming a hegemonic naval powerhouse while subsidizing and delegating specific regions for private trading companies to monopolize off of. For example, the Muscovy Company was in charge of trading with Russia. The East India Company took over the Indian Ocean and the Hudson Bay Company was in charge of Canada. Oh, wow. Granted, much of their economic My ancestors were farmers and shepherds until the Industrial Revolution, where they moved to London. Do the British use condensed milk, evaporated milk for with their tea? Normal milk for tea tastes kind of diluted tea. Yeah, I know. I was thinking about the same thing. You know, tea with milk, it seems kind of strong. It seems like, especially English breakfast. I mean, I guess... The English breakfast they, they sell here is not very authentic. Uh, but even then, I can't imagine having English breakfast tea with milk, you know, at least like regular milk. I feel the, the milk would override the, the, the flavor of the tea. Activity was also riddled with labor but I don't know, maybe. Slave African peoples, even though it was never recognized in British law. Most of the about two and a half million people were transported to the Caribbean, the second most popular destination after Brazil, to work on mostly sugar plantations between the 17th and 19th centuries. Eventually, slavery was abolished in 1807 with the Slave Trade Act. However, in practice, it still went on for over two more decades until the Slave Abolition Act was passed in 1833. Of course, this was a dark moment of oh. history for the UK. Eventually those we use regular milk. I'm actually drinking tea with milk right now. I think I should have done uh I think, think I should have made some tea, you know, for this occasion. Like Jamaica, Barbados, and most of the lesser Antilles islands. Overall, you can see how the story of industrialization mixed with naval trade were key factors. And speaking of naval activity, you can occasionally find things like gray seals and basking sharks in the waters around the UK. And to talk more about the wildlife, here's Gary Harlow. You look a lot like Caleb. I'm back! You can't get rid of me and my amazingly accurate Aussie accent. So first, let's focus on Whatever, Great Britain. dude. Today there are 14 national parks, 9 in England, 3 in Wales, and 2 in Scotland. There aren't many large mammals found on the island. Today, the largest native mammal is the red deer. Most of the predators yeah, oh like no. wolves and bears were hunted to extinction centuries ago. Those bearskin caps worn by the Queen's Guard were actually made from Canadian black bear pelts. Oh. Oh, wow. a temperate climate zone, reptiles are not very common. Only three native species of lizard exist, and all snakes except the European edda are non-venomous. The national animals of the UK all make no sense. For England, it's the lion, which is not even native to I just don't like this guy, but... I'm gonna, I'm gonna let his segment, you know, just because this time I think it might be interesting than others. European continent, let alone the UK. Whereas for Scotland, it's the unicorn. The unicorn, yeah, this is Wales a Wales is the Welsh dragon, which haven't been you. discussed. Yet, but I'm on it. Most people will say that the English bulldog is a very yeah. iconic animal that epitomizes <laughs> the breed. I, I, I do feel it's kind of like iconic, isn't it? I mean, it's probably the most iconic animal from the UK, even though. If it like is it actually like British? I may I don't know. Maybe it's not. But man, it is an it's iconic. Spirit. Otherwise, Dog. if we are discussing the overseas territories abroad, the wildlife spectrum expands to a wide range that includes things like flamingos <laughs> and iguanas in Turks and Caicos, to elephant seals and macaroni penguins of the South Georgia and South Sandwich and Islands. Puffins. And Talk about very puffins, popular dude. Breeding ground for various species. I guess that's it. <laughs> I guess I guess I'll go uh, back into the blackness now. I fade out. Obscurity. Thank Where God. Go? Where will I... we go next? Thank you, Gary. Definitely not Caleb Harlow. Well, as you can see, the ocean has played a huge role in the UK story, whether it be the naval trading route. Oh, Beagles or also originated in the UK. To talk more about oh, nice. the food of the UK, here's one of our British jogger peeps, Rob. Oh, hey! no. Oh, he's going to talk about the food. Man, this is going to be, I think this is going to be an interesting segment. We all know the memes, right? The UK doesn't have tasty food. 
But let's see what they say, you know, hey, maybe we'd, we'd be guys? surprised. It's my section now. Noah, I'm coming for you. But Britain tends to have a reputation, particularly among the rest of Europe, for having dull, bland, flavourless food. But you know what? I would say that's not the case. Nah, it's just we enjoy <laughs> we bully him like he's in middle food school. <laughs> and we do have flavour. For one, the most popular dish in Britain by some distance is a curry. Most notably is the chicken tikka masala, which wasn't even invented in India, claimed to be invented by a Pakistani in Glasgow. The dish we're most particularly proud of has to be the full English. You know, your breakfast, the eggs, your bean, bacon, sausage, black pudding, yeah. shit. <laughs> um. Oh, God. Oh, that looks... Ah, oh, it looks fucking horrible, dude. <laughs> Damn, that's nasty. I'm sorry. I was just eating a chicken quesadilla. Yeah, you know, that's some good food. Beans. Yes, the tomato looks... Guys, I like actually want to puke. The beans and the sausage. That looks nasty. The tomato also looks pretty... Oh. It's pig's blood. No. <clears throat> oh, God. Oh, my God. Bro, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I had a strong reaction. Tomatoes. I don't know why I had such a strong reaction though. This, I mean, it just, it just doesn't, it looks very strange. Like, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm really sorry. I, uh, it just doesn't look good though. And mushrooms. Otherwise, some of the top dishes you might encounter. My God, it's pig, it's pig's blood. What do you mean? It's actually like pig's blood, like the blood of a pig. And you eat that? Let's say it's exotic. Yeah, let's say it's exotic cuisine. A visit to the UK are things like Yorkshire pudding, bangers and mash, marmite. But if you do put it on toast, you've got to put it lightly. You can't overdo it. Lancashire hot pot, toad in the hole. Welsh rare. Okay, Cornish well... pasties, Scotch egg, beef wellington. Okay, that looks good. Pie, steak and kidney pie. Pie and mash with jelly deals, which is an East London shepherd, delicacy. Shepherd's pie is also good, right? I think I've had uh, shepherd parts in America. Shepherd's pie? We love our meat pies. And of course, you cannot visit the UK without having our most famous dish. Uh, that looks good, though. Whitby that looks really good. for having some of the best fish and chips in the country. For dessert, you might want to try something like an Eaton mess, Ooh. bake well tart, oh my sticky God. toffee pudding, trifle, and Ooh. so much more. I hope you guys come and there have a bite. There we go, yeah. The UK. The pastries and the dessert, that's good. That's good. Okay. Okay. I'll have, I'll have, I'll skip, I'll skip the meals. You know, I'll go straight for the desserts when I'm in the UK. Honestly, dude. Uh, eat eels in my life. Yeah, I know, right? My grandmother does the best meat pies. That sounds good though. Those pies are honestly really good. Mexican and British are united under the bean. I mean, yeah, but... I feel like it's a little different, okay, you know? I'll just Rob leave Peters. it at that. Thank you, Rob. Hey, Noah, he said he's coming for you. What do you say to that? We'll see. <laughs> well, that's all I got for you all today. I'm also coming for you, you dude. The next one. Back to you, Barbs and Jay. Thank you. That was awesome. You did a great job. We just had a whole section about British food and you didn't mention crumpets. Oh. You gotta have a, I'll get you a crumpet. Hang on. I'll... Oh, oh, okay. This is a crumpet. Mm. Is that butter? Mm-hmm. Mm, I like butter. I approve. Uh, demographics. Demographics, okay. <laughs> no. Okay, crumpets. In Korea, they eat live squid. Oh, Question God. is, what does it mean to be British? Simply, beans on toast. A British person is um, a Greg sausage roll, knowing the difference between a cheeky Nando's and spoons. Welcome to Wales. <laughs> we actually are a country. We have a language. It's the, the rugby, the communities, and the sites, as you can see. Oh. Oh. 
For me, a Scottish person is someone who has broad, thick accent that is barely recognisable. Yeah. Iron Brew, the Big Proclaimers, accent. Still Game, Haggis, this is our wee hill in Glen. Foolish breakfast on a Saturday morning and irony. You should have a Sunday roast in a pub on Sunday. Someone of any background and um, everyone has a voice, everyone can say what they want. Bloody brilliant at queuing. We could be passively, aggressively polite. Someone who loves to complain about the weather. You complain about the weather, complain yeah. about the football. Especially British. Well, I, think, I think that relates all British people is the <laughs> fact that uh, we created all these sports and yet we're so bad at all of them. The uniform, the benches <laughs> for the year six, Biff and Chip. Someone from the UK is very self-deprecating. We love to take the piss. Kind of like licorice all sorts. Everyone is mixed up with different things, but it's kind of like a big family that kind of argues with each other. So what is okay, a person that was from nice. the UK? Was well, awesome. I mean, that question already in itself kind of has a little bit of a title dilemma in it. Sometimes it's hard to even give a demonym for the people living here. And for many of the people, and depending on the area, the title British might, un might, might not even be considered applicable. Yeah, Scottish really? and Welsh people will typically tell you that they are Scottish and Welsh first. People on the Isle of Man are Manx, and all those penguins in South Georgia are... <laughs> But for what it's worth, there's so much that goes into the concept of identity. When you break down the typical person that comes from the UK, it's not an easy question to answer. But what we can attempt to break down is the ethnic makeup of the country in the demographics graph. Henceforth, let's do it. For one, the UK has just over 68 million people Whoa. and as of 2023 is speculated to now have the third largest population in Europe just surpassing France. Russia when it comes Russia. to ethnic makeup, it's Russia a little complicated Germany, to come by. But according to the most recent data from the Office of National Statistics, it is reported that the largest group are the white British peoples at somewhere around 87% of the country. This category is pretty broad, however. The office designates... Yeah, white inside, the white, inside the white, you of course have English, Scottish... Welsh, and I've heard there's like a lot of, well, Irish, obviously in Northern Ireland and in the UK, but like there's a lot of like Polish and other Europeans, right? Subgroups of white British, which includes Scottish and Welsh, Irish, Irish traveler, and whites of other nationalities. The remaining 13-ish percent are made up of other non-white ethnic backgrounds, the largest being Asians, Asian British yeah. peoples at somewhere around 7% of the country. The majority come from South Asian countries like India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. About Free Northern 3 Ireland. are black British, mostly from Caribbean I've always said, and West African I'm English backgrounds. First, and British around 2% identify wow. as ethnically mixed individuals, and around 1% identify with other groups. The UK uses the type G plug outlet, and they drive on the left side. Of the road and fun is fact. there a lot of Latinos in the UK? I don't think so, right? I mean, there's probably not a big Mexican community in the UK, but Latinos from other places, I guess Caribbeans maybe count as Latinos, but like Latinos from like Latin America, like, well, mainland Latin America. So like Mexico or Brazil, Argent I, I can't imagine Argentinians living in the UK, you know, I, I don't think there's a lot of them either, but it's because of the jousting thing, I believe? Sort of. So no one really so, knows yeah. why, but one Probably theory not. is that when uh, medieval jousting happened, you used to hold the sword in your right hand, so it made sense to pass on the left. Big the Asian and black communities, the British but not many Latinos. As its currency, oh, okay. sometimes called quid. That's right. Except in certain overseas territories, they may use other regional currencies. And that brings us to another <clears> quirky <throat> aspect of the UK, units of measurement. So the UK was, of course, the birthplace of the famous imperial system. However, over the past few decades, the UK has been begrudgingly transitioning partially to metric. And the choice of of units huh. to use is absolutely insane. For example, speed, miles per hour, temperature, centigrade. For weight, if the subject is a person, you can use stone or pounds, but everything else, kilos and grams. For distance, if it's long distance, like on the road, we use miles, unless oh if you're running, then it's kilometers. But what a clusterfuck. So you use both, basically? Jesus. As someone who goes a lot to the US, uh, I can tell you it's really hard to like, transform i use for example centimeters or kilometers instead of miles i can't imagine using both as, as being easy or i don't know apparently there are about a quarter million latinos in the uk a quarter million nah bro that can't be true i mean most spaniards are in gibraltar yeah but if measuring a person, you speak in inches. Water million, Any other wow. object, though, meters and centimeters. For volume, liters and milliliters, unless it's beer or milk when we use pints, but only cow's milk, not oh, pot milk, in which yeah. case they use I've heard, I've heard the whole pint thing because of beer, and I'm sure you can find, like, plenty of hipster places where you can say, like, a pint of beer in the U.S. 
Or even maybe even pints here. That are a little bigger than American yeah. pints. Yeah, that's a thing. That's oh, a thing. Okay. Although there's okay. technically no official language, the country's de facto national language is, of course, English. Or Yay. technically, modern English, which is incredibly different from old English. And during the 16th century, Shakespearean times, an early I version of the, the modern system. Style of English we know today started to evolve. Thank you, Shakespeare. <clears throat> and this, of course, brings us to the famous British versus American English scenario. The spelling subtleties are minor. Brits tend to spell words that are more similar to their Latin and Germanic origins, whereas Americans spell things more phonetically. Otherwise, uh, some words are just completely different such as apartment, flat, fries, chips, chips, crisps, truck, lorry, gas, petrol, cookie, biscuit, trash can, rubbish bin, yard, garden, sidewalk, rubbish pavement, bin, pavement, road surface, candy, sweets, faucet, tap, spigot, tap, flashlight, torch, oatmeal, porridge. But I do admit I like porridge better because it reminds me of fairy tales from childhood. <laughs> I know, just try saying the word porridge and not being just a little bit more happy. <laughs> porridge, it's like the, the, the Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Porridge. Porridge. And don't even get me started on the accents. In fact, it's speculated that the UK has the largest variation of accents in a single language of any country in the world. Somewhere around 40 to 50, I believe. It is yeah. nuts. Like, if you think about just how small our islands are, and yet the accents have remained really resilient. The two cities of Liverpool and Manchester, only 30 miles apart, they sound completely different. Otherwise, the UK also really? has regionally recognized wow. native Celtic-based minority languages. For example, Cornish is spoken in Cornwall by about four people, and Scottish Gaelic is spoken in Scotland, and by far the biggest of these surviving Celtic languages is Welsh. There are even Welsh TV channels and shows, radio stations, and almost all road signs are posted in Welsh and English in Wales. Each of these languages play a vital role to the culture of their respective communities. Religion! Now this is an interesting one because for most of the UK's history, there's always been kind of like a complication when it came to religious affairs. And I mean, that is true, right? Henry VIII. Um, I guess that religion has always been a complicated matter in England. I imagine most English, I'm gonna, well, I'm gonna say British, most British being Protestants, uh, with of course minorities of like Muslims and Hindus and all that, but after the Church of England renounced papal authority from the Catholic Church in 1534, things got yeah. tricky. It was kind of like, Oh heavens, our dear monarch hath doth done it died. <laughs> he shall be if next in line. If. It's insert name of next to kin. But here's the problem. The Catholic. Jolly toddly wonkles. Oh my no. god, no. Well. That's burn things. That seemed to solve problems. Burn! And that's like how 28% of their painful. domestic war started. In any case, the country is technically a Christian country. Actually, it's technically a theocracy where the crown gets its power from God. Long story. And a majority of them hold religion to more of a traditional role, mostly reserved for national festivals, traditions, and even schools and politics. With all that said and done, it's very important to also highlight the immigrant and non-European communities that make up a very notable demographic of the UK yeah. as well. The black community dates back to the 17th century, when attendants and servants were brought over, such as John Blank during the Tudor dynasty, who was paid about 16 pence a day for his trumpeting skills. Most of the enslaved black people okay. were brought to the Caribbean, <laughs> not Great Britain. So the black British community stayed relatively small and was mostly confined to Liverpool. It wasn't until the mid-20th century when communities from the Caribbean and West Africa started to set up communities over here. The UK also has the oldest Chinese community in Europe arriving in the 19th century, followed by other Asian groups like Indians and Arabs. Basically, no matter who you are or what you are, everyone born and raised in the UK will have a common understanding of a certain set of values and my customs. My dad family are Anglican. The schooling system. Well, my oh, mom's are Catholic. So you might have got hints wow. of what it's like from the Harry Potter films and books. Oh, Uniforms are worn not only to show school identity, but also to foster a sense of unity and equality. And you can't make fun of the kids that wear bad clothes because it's like they're all wearing the same thing. Yeah. That is a little strange, right? I mean, I remember in my private school in Mexico, we used to wear uniforms, but sometimes I feel like I don't know. What's your feeling about that? I feel like a lot of Americans are not going to agree with that because in America at least most times you get to just wear normal clothing so it's kind of weird to see you know uniforms Nobody like can, that well you can still bully people also but... like <laughs> you can still you not on clothes education is a huge part of our culture english maths that's right maths not you, math you say maths you say maths not mathematics and science and even physical education are compulsory subjects for every stage until the gcse exams and compulsory education ends at age 18. yeah and you have that college is another so like thing high school but it's like you're well right yeah. so the word college yeah. is for older children it's for teenagers who've chosen to study something very specific yes yeah that's whereas in america it's just you call college what we call university. It's, it's where we get wasted because we're saying we're studying but we're not. Another unique trait of the UK's social atmosphere is the fact that since it is a constitutional monarchy, much of the country has a deep tie Okay, to so like religion. college is not actually college, it's right? Monarchy. The inner core of the royal family today has about 50 or so members that are either descended or the House of Windsor. the House of Windsor. Only about half of them actually carry out royal duties, which usually include diplomatic missions and being the face of the UK. Whatever you want to make of that. Outside of the royal family, of course, many noblemen were appointed leadership roles over certain areas, and today you can still even find many people that are descended from these 
lesser ranked individuals that had ties to the monarch. Lesser well, nobility, can, you right? The very posh public schools, which, by the way, is what we call what you call private schools. Right. Uh, you're likely to run into people who say, oh, I'm actually 718th in line to the throne because my uh, third father once removed was the 13th Duke and Duchess of Wyndham. Sometimes you'll find heirs to the throne where you least expect it. For example, did you know that Olympian Zara Phillips is the Queen's granddaughter? No, I did not know that. But we can learn more about the sports... Sport. ...of the UK with art with the sports part. Sport part. The sport part. All right, guys, I'm back. Let's get athletic. And the UK is quite the contender. They have nearly a thousand medals in the Olympics and nearly 300 of which are gold. The UK is the father of many types of sports. Rugby, cricket, yes, even soccer or football. Yeah. And hey, for all you Brits that are criticizing us Americans for calling it soccer, we got the word from you. You invented it. It came from the word association football. So it's kind of your fault. Although the concept of playing a game where you kick a ball around has been around since the ancient times, the modern version of what we call football, was started in the UK in, England, in the yeah. 19th century using inflated pig bladders. I wonder how they got started with that. They're just like, they're eating some bacon. And yeah, like, let's kick like, this oh, thing, you know? Kind of inflatable, you know? <laughs> like, so far, England has won one World Cup in 1966. It's coming home. Germany. It's and coming it was in home. iconic old Wembley Stadium that has since Well, it hasn't come home in a while, but, problem. you know, maybe someday. it was someday. buried under a huge grass mound. Also, the trophy was stolen, but found by Pickles the dog true story either way football is such a huge part of the okay. uk's identity and they could talk about it forever they even have a subculture of hooligans or the obnoxious football fans that like always get drunk and yeah damn and beat each other up it's almost like a whole other sport itself and it's equally entertaining to watch like drunken mma right? is it like really like that or i mean because that's what you imagine as a foreigner you imagine like oh my god all these hooligans are gonna like be very dangerous and stuff but is it like really like that or is it rare? I imagine it's rare that stuff like this happens in games in the Premier League, I imagine. But I don't think it's like that common, right? Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, the modern form of rugby or rugby union was invented in the town of Rugby, where it got its name from. However, many will it say can rugby be is if the team lost, from loses. the Welsh game Jesus to Napa, which is why today some of the best rugby players come from Wales and is a huge part of their national identity. Cricket was invented in South England in the 1500s and is one of the most long-winded sports that can last days to finish. Scotland is also a hub of inventing sports. The modern version of golf was also started in Scotland okay, in the 19th wow. century and water polo in the 19th century. Scotland is also most noted for their Highland Games, <laughs> where a bunch of people in kilts compete in a series of strength-based events wow. like the caber toss, Scottish hammer throw, and the weight over bar toss. I oh, need by the way, to I watch that, test, dude. I need to fucking watch that. 48% Scottish. Thought you were Polish. Yeah, so... Yeah, what the hell? He, wasn't he supposed to be, like, Polish? Oh, a lot less Polish than what I thought. What? I mean, it makes sense, though. They'll I take mean, me in. It makes sense, the gingery. The ginge. I'm Scottish. <laughs> I should have known. In Northern Ireland, it's not uncommon to see Gaelic football and hurling being played, native to the island. The UK is also known Jesus for their weird Christ. and wacky sports and competition. It was really bad in the 80s, 90s. It chilled out a lot since many fights have started over one team losing. People loving taking part. In, such as the Cooper Hill cheese rolling race thing, tar barrel racing, toe wrestling, shin kicking. Let's do that one. We'll, we'll do it after this. <laughs> Pancake racing, the stinging nettle eating contest. Yeah, I used to get stung Ooh. by those things all the time when I was a kid. Like, I cannot imagine eating those things. Gravy wrestling. These are weird. They even have a gurning contest, which is where, like, in order to win, you have to make, like, the ugliest face possible. Like this. <laughs> In any case, that's all I got for you. Cheerio, toodle pop, <laughs> jolly good, crumbly wrinkles, old chap, and redhead people are so cool. It's like so rare. It is so rare, even in places like the U.S. I mean, in Mexico, it's extremely rare to find a redhead. I mean, like extremely rare. I remember there was one back again in my high school, but other than that, I don't think I've met a Mexican redhead. But I'm. But they Whatever. exist. Whatever. I'm gonna get that. <laughs> This ginger's gonna skedaddle out of here. Toodaloo. <laughs>
Thank you, Art. Jay, what are some just of the biggest, most notable traditions you've experienced living here? The day after Christmas, we call it Boxing Day, the 26th of December. It's an extension of the holiday, okay. so you get yet another day off work, and there's also a lot of football going on and lots of great stuff on the telly. I thought that was a day where you box each other because you're fighting over cheap prices at the grocery store. Actually, fun fact, the reason it's called Boxing Day is... Barb's was kind of right. Originally, it was supposed to be about giving gifts to the poor, but now it's about getting half-off deals at the mall. Yeah, Boxing no. Day. Okay, well, good okay. way to transition into the culture of the UK, and with that, let's bring it to to our homegirl, Hannah, with the culture segment. Hey guys, I'm back. Well, actually now, we're back. Ah! If you don't get it, I'm, I'm pregnant. Hannah did a thing. And Ian, he was there too. Okay, this is gonna be a heavy one because with the UK- Well, congrats. Almost like you're getting an economy-sized multi-package deal of culture and tradition. For one, you must distinguish between whether someone is from England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, the overseas territories, or crown dependencies. To break it down a little easier, you have the Celtic areas, and then you have the Anglo-Saxon side. So let's start with a quick overview. Wait, is the fake Australian man his husband? No way, dude. Of Scotland. Cultural rule number one, do not attempt the accent. Even if you think you're good at it, just don't. You're not good at it. <laughs> that was so bad. <laughs> Historically, Scotland was divided by clans, each with their own territory. Her. Yes way? Wow, I mean, good for him, I guess. You know, I mean, we give him a lot of shit, but he's done something right in his life. Good Each for him, good for them. had their own plaid tartan design. And Scottish last names often have a map before it. Some very notable cultural aspects you will probably encounter at some point include Kaylee dances, bagpipes. January 25th is a huge deal where they celebrate Burns Night. New Year's Eve is called Hogmanay, fireball swinging. And the first person <laughs> to enter the household is considered the bringer of good luck. And the iconic New Year's did something song, never Old could. Lang Syne. You know yeah. that song. Da -na. I guess I guess I'm now a little jealous. Old Lang Syne. Who knew that's what they were saying? I was just making words up. <laughs> also, everyone in Scotland will tell you to try a deep fried Mars bar. As now Wales. Wales is a unique and deep very fried Mars place. bar. It is the land Why? of song, poetry, but at the same time, hardcore rugby, shin kicking, dragon, <laughs> and we gotta stop roasting him. Yeah, he earned it. You know, he totally earned it powerful castles. In Wales, the daffodil is a symbol used for women and the leek used for men. Typical emblems <laughs> He's of the better than all of us now. are worn on St. David's Day, where people clean their rooms and are nice to one another. Are they not <laughs> The nice? fake Australian guy has a girl. What have you done? You know? Nice other days? <laughs> you get what one day a year to be nice. <laughs> and speaking of which, love spoons. In Wales, traditionally, a man would carve a spoon and give it to the woman he loved. They have the Maori Giga boy Chad celebration, Harlow. where they put a horse's <laughs> school on a pole. The Don's gum ride. The Estid Fod is a huge deal. Every Welsh person will bring up Tom, Tom Jones. Jones. Yeah. Uh, no, 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 you want to be loved by anyone. Moving on to Northern Ireland. It's good, this you know, Tom Jones. a complicated one because it's kind of like if the UK and Ireland had a confusing baby that had an identity crisis. Avoiding all the complicated politics that go into this one. This yeah. area obviously has a more Irish Celtic influence and has a mix of Protestant Catholic people. This is the only place that allows people to freely choose to have either one or both citizenship of either the UK or Ireland. Keep in mind, this really? is not wow. the official flag of Northern Ireland. Just watch the show Dairy Girls. It does a great job at covering the general idea of what Northern Ireland was like, especially at the end of the conflict era. England! It is, in itself, super complicated and culturally diverse. It is home to the monarchy, which is a vital aspect of their identity. Keep in mind, all those certain Certain individuals can be knighted for their accomplishments. It is only a recognition, not an inclusion into royalty. Generally speaking, English regional cultures are mostly Anglo-Saxon based and concentrated in six areas. Speaking of which, England has the widest range of classical architecture. You can find people living in Tudor style half timber thatch roofed homes next to Victoria, wow. next to Georgia, next to Art Deco, all in the same block. Also, the UK loves to give regional nicknames to people. Liverpool people, Scouse, Birmingham, are Broomies, Manchester is Mank, Newcastle is Jordy, Jordy. Sunderland is Mackin, Devon and Plymouth folk Is that why it's called Jordy Shore? Um, the, if you haven't watched, the, it's like a reality show. It's very trashy. Don't watch it, but 
It's called Geordie Shore, and I never understood Banners. why. East Londoners are Cockney, and they speak in a weird codified language. Much of what might be considered English culture was spurred off by the English Renaissance. The era created some of the most renowned authors and playwrights, most notable the man himself, William the Shakespeare. Bragging rights, As a nation, <laughs> the UK was the home of many inventions and discoveries. Way too many people to mention. We'll just pop up a list here. Cinema has always been a huge part of UK culture and has been contributing to the world since 1888 when the first motion picture in the world was shot in Leeds by Louis Le Prince. Hey, Louis Le Prince was not British, he was French. I know, I'm just saying he made his motion picture in the UK. D'accord, tu peux continuer maintenant. Anywho. The fact that the American version of The Office was inspired by the UK version of The Office and that is one of our most like well-renowned television shows is amazing. I mean, it's one, it's one of my favorite TV shows of all time. Honestly, I think we did better though, come on. I, Kevin Malone, yeah. best character. Kevin Malone? <laughs> our version of Dwight is way better than y'all's. I'm so sorry. He our version of Dwight? There's only one Dwight though. No one is gonna do better than Dwight, really I'm sorry. Is. In any case, the territories and crown dependencies all have their own unique traits as well. Jersey and Guernsey and the Isle of Man each have their own languages and confusing political systems. In Gibraltar- I know, right? Yeah, the, the fact that Shakespeare contributed more to modern day English than any other individual is such a huge flex. I don't. The pit Karen and you guys Islands get to flex has that. a Polynesian Creole called Pit Kern. Turks and Caicos has a Caribbean House Evolution Boat Party. And the Cayman Islands have an entire week Pirate dedicated week. to pirates. Well, that was a lot. And we didn't even cover a small fraction of everything that could be discussed with the UK culture. And of course, one huge facet of UK culture is their music. And with that, Keith is on tour. Can't leave his dream job to be here. Ugh. So let's give this segment to a British musician. Guys, say hi to David. Did he say a British piece of shit? Oh. So let's give this segment to a British musician. Guys, say hi to David. Okay, okay, well. And we got David here. Uh, explain who you are. Introduce yourself. I'm a music nerd from the UK and I have a channel called David Bennett Piano. Britain has always had a rich musical culture. We had the Elizabethan lute music of John Dowland. The... <laughs> I mean... I love Keith, don't get me wrong, but yeah, this guy seems like an actual... Well, I mean, Keith is also a musician, right? He's on tour, so... But this guy seems like a little bit more, I don't know, less crazy, I guess. Grand Baroque music of Handel, and at the start of the 20th century, we had two of Britain's... He looks more normal, you know? Gustav Holst and Edward Elgar. But it wasn't really until the just like a little British like twink British instead of whatever Keith is. is today. <laughs> but I love course, Keith, you know. Don't get me wrong. Invasion, where bands such as the Rolling Stones, the Kinks, the Animals, yeah. and of course the Beatles took the. Yo, out. that's actually true though. Like British, I mean the UK, the the UK's influence on music is huge, like huge. Storm. And then since that invasion, the UK has continued to contribute to global popular music. Many genres My God. since that invasion. Who is this guy, dude? Is this like Ringo or I don't know, he's ugly. The UK has continued to contribute to global popular music. Many genres of music can trace their origins back to the UK. Heavy metal, for example, was pioneered in the early 70s by the likes of Black Sabbath, Led Zeppelin, and Deep Purple. And many of prog rock's most iconic bands hail from the UK, including Queen? Pink Floyd, Yes, and Genesis. Highly successful artists have hailed from every corner of the UK. The most famous Welsh musician is probably Sir Tom Jones. Northern Ireland has Van Morrison, and Scotland's most successful musician Calvin is Harris. probably Calvin Harris. Britain has always had a strong history history of folk music as well particularly in scotland where gaelic language music is still no need to roast him yeah no 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 he's a good he's the transition to that he's Queen, cool david bowie george michael kate bush oasis elton john elton Reddy john Reddy that's Coldplay, true the spice girls Coldplay. ed sheeran adele ever since that british invasion in the 1960s big musicians big churning out culture defining music and i'm sure it will play a major part in popular music for decades to come Thank you, yeah. David. Actually, uh, guys, if you didn't know, uh, Jay is a musician. You make music as well. Oh, really? Well. Um, do, sometimes. What are some of your biggest uh, inspirations in music? Is it really, really boring and dull and uninteresting if I say that my favorite band is the Beatles? Yeah, it kind of does. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Basic! Well, uh, we covered so much in this segment. Jay, what's, uh, what else can we talk about in this episode? Shall we do the friend zone? <laughs> can cook, but he can compose music. So obviously, the UK has a lot of diversity, and of course, it's due to their history. As you can see, Britain has had a fair few <laughs> wow. with other countries. My dad didn't like the English, but he loved their music. 
That's nice. That's around awesome. the world, which brings us to the animation, the, the, the motion graphic. First of all, as a permanent member of the UN Security Council and founding member of numerous IGOs, such as the G7, NATO, World Trade Organization, and Council of Europe, the UK has lots of international ties. Although the Brexit situation did cut them off from EU authority, many of the diplomatic laws and trade deals with the EU are almost exactly the same as they were pre-Brexit, and today the interaction is still there and open. It's just a little different when it comes to certain legislative issues like immigration and economic policy. This is a topic for an other time. In any case, the UK has spent the last hundred years coming to terms with the fact that they were pretty much seen as the antagonist in so many independent stories across the world. Even though the empire has gone, its influence is still strong. I mean, how many countries uh, get their independence from the UK? Uh, it has to be like 40 at least. Oh, what happened? of other across the world. Even though the empire has gone, its influence is still strongly felt around the world, with lots of other countries speaking English, playing cricket, having similar-ish systems. Are we the so bad many guys? Many of these countries are members of the Commonwealth <laughs> of Nations, and the monarch is still, at least in a figurehead sense, the head of state of many of them. The UK still has very close relations to the Commonwealth countries, with many of these people settling wow. in the UK. Enough to have celebration every week of the year. Most Jesus. notably, some of the largest diaspora communities from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nigeria, Ghana, and the Caribbean. The UK, or England in particular, had a massive rivalry with France riddled with yeah. war for much of their history. For the last century though, especially after World War II, they've done a complete 180 and have found themselves on the same team in almost all global conflicts. And each side loves to poke fun, but in a loving way, at each other. Interestingly enough, the country they probably have the most in common with, Ireland, has had quite a few scuffles in conflict, especially before the Good Friday Agreement was signed in 1998. Today, however, you can't deny that the citizens of both countries enjoy an extremely close relationship. Many British people have Irish heritage, they intermarry quite a bit, and many have dual citizenship. Australia and Spain have the largest communities of British national residents living abroad. Australia has always been a hotbed destination for immigration for Brits seeking the warmer climate, and specifically for Spain, Ibiza is almost like a little Britain, as so many British people either go there on holiday or to move. Or In terms of their best to party, you know, Ibiza is like a huge spot for like parties. As friends, stuff. however, many in the UK would probably say the USA and maybe some might include Canada. The biggest differences between the two is that the USA gained full independence through revolution, whereas Canada just kind of stayed British Peacefully. until they slowly over time requested to be given more and more autonomy until Germans moved to Mallorca. When they adopted their own really? constitution, but still remained under the Commonwealth. It wasn't even long after the Revolutionary War that the UK and US. My grand, my grandmother was Irish. Oh, great grandmother. That, that makes sense. That's why you mentioned uh, they were Catholics, right? From your mom's side of the family? They quickly patched things up. Having a shared language and today a population with about 11% of its people ethnically descended from British roots has not only further helped them communicate and relate culturally, but eventually they've joined in almost all major international conflicts since the mid-19th century. Today they swap each other's films, TV shows, music, and so on. And in Europe, anything USA related will typically have some kind of connection to the UK as they kind of act as like the link between North America and Europe. Overall, the USA and UK may have started sour, but today they have never been closer. All right, and with that, in conclusion, uh, Jay, you are the Brit. I'm going to give this to you. In conclusion, sorry about the empire, but basically Britain is now <laughs> finding its role as a modern progressive country that hopes to leave a good mark on the world. This flag actually makes me realize that when Brits go abroad, even though we like to claim that we're not very patriotic, you know, we go abroad and it turns out, yes, we really are. And we really care and we really do love our country. And they hate when people fly their flag upside down! <laughs> Isn't also backwards? Everything's wrong. Well, uh, Jay, I think there was nobody better than you to be in this episode and to oh, co-host with you. me. Uh, guys, I guess uh, that means stay tuned. The home country, USA, is coming up next. Good luck. Wow, dude. That was so cool, though. This was by far one of my favorite episodes. It didn't even felt long, dude. I mean... 50 minutes, but it felt like nothing really. Wow. I guess that tells you that the United K the, the UK, it re it's really like a huge country, but it's also very influential in the world around us. You know, you can't really look at culture or music or sports without really finding out someone, something either made by the British or influenced by the British. So I don't know. I think this episode had to be long. At least it's kind of symbolic because it's a huge country. I have a lot of people view me from the UK and 
just overall one of the bigger countries out there. So I'm really happy about this episode. It was really big. It's not a big country, but it's a, yeah, that's true. That's true though. It's not necessarily a big country. It's just a, a deep country. There's so much surrounding the UK, so much history, so much culture, so much, even like politics. The UK has formed like, or been part of like a lot of organizations. Um, just a huge, huge country overall. Uh, deep, sorry. It's not particularly big or populated, but, you know, it has made its impact, definitely, in the world. So, here's the thing, guys. I was actually not gonna uh, make this video because, like I said, tomorrow I have to travel. However, for me, it was really important to, to stream this episode. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, it's a short stream because in reality, I have still things to do. I actually have to go get a haircut because tomorrow I have a job interview, which is very important. So uh, enough said, I think. Thank you guys so much for watching. It was super fun. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and do all those delicious things. And I'll see you shortly. Very, very soon. Very, very soon.